Thank, thank you. Um, I have to be tied here because uh, this is where the microphone is, and I don't think my voice uh, is going to be able to reach in the back. But there's a lot of information here, but the one thing I wanted to uh, assure you all is that the transition from school to adult life, which looms for every family and professional who guides them, and, and for a show of hands, how many are family members? Okay, and the majority of family members. Okay, so I'll tell you this. It's going to be the only thing that's going to make you feel less anxious is actually going through it. Um, because uh, when uh, a, a family uh, once said to me when the child leaved, left early intervention and went to public school, they felt like they were going from a cruise ship to a dinghy. And I said, oh my goodness, you have no idea what kind of dinghy is in store for you because the dinghy really is at the end of the school years. But I'm going to hopefully go through a lot of material with you. Um, if you want this presentation, um, emailed to you, we can make that um, happen for you as well. The book that was referenced was originally uh, written for, gener for generically for any kind of person with an intellectual developmental disability. And families who have typical children have said to me that it's been very valuable. But the publisher said, if you put Down syndrome or autism in the title, we can sell more books. So um, if you, this presentation is actually you know, a snippet of what's included in the book, the Down syndrome transition handbook, which you can now get used on Amazon very inexpensively. Um, so, uh, my son, I'm going to go through this. So I really um, think that this is what has compounded our challenges as family members our entire life. Really, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam, please climb that tree. What you, the beauty of transition and adulthood is it can be individualized to the needs of your family member or the person you're supporting. Um, transition planning begins at age 14 or in, or in the ninth grade. You know, and earlier is the better. Some families start trans thinking about the adult life when their ch children are born. And some people put a, you know, a visor on and a mask on and they don't look at it until the child is 21 or 22 or 35 or, si or even older. Um, but it's, transition is really big news. It's very important to the federal government. It's uh, very important to the, the rehab commission laws. It's very important because we've shown that we schools are not doing an adequate job preparing our children for adulthood. So it's really incumbent upon us to really understand and make the school years, I think, as important as possible so that the transition can be as successful as possible. But the transition doesn't happen on one day. It's, a seri it's not like getting a driver's license. You know, or the day you register to vote. Transition is an ongoing process. My son's 37, and there are still areas that we're still transitioning with as into you know, adulthood. But this is what makes adulthood so complicated. And uh, ignore the bolding, because um, I don't know why it is bolded, but they're all equally important. But these are the, some of the issues that are going to face you as family members and for your children as they become adults. Um, and we'll go through some of these um, as we go along. Some people are a little overwhelmed with, well, how do I get started in planning for my child's future? And we'll rely on some sort of person-centered planning. And I don't have a show of hands of people heard about person-centered planning. OK. That's unusual, because by this time, most people might have heard about a process of person-centered planning, which you actually will do a planning process based on the individual as the focal point. And there are many, and these are some of the different kinds of person-centered planning tools that are out there. Now, for those of you who didn't, didn't raise your hand, don't feel badly because I have never used any of these tools because I knew exactly with my son and with other family members what we envisioned his adult life to look like. So we didn't really need to go through a process. But this is a very helpful process for many people of bringing together people who are interested in your child, family members, professional, neighbors, for really you know, kicking the tire kind of exercise to say, what does the future look for her? And how are we going to get there? So it may be worth looking into that. So the reason that transition has become so important is that most of you are probably coming from states where there's you know, testing under no child left behind, which has really impacted individuals who are, have any kind of learning disabilities. IDEA has regulations that specifically talk about transition, which must include post-secondary goals and appropriate transition goals. So it's no longer you can just say, oh, that person might have a significant learning disability. We're not expecting a lot from them, so therefore we're just going to move on. I think the access to the regular curriculum has been probably the most fundamental 
positive change in education um, that folks with learning disability ha has had as a tool for them. Um, so I'm going to go through a transition checklist uh, for those of you who might be interested about how to get the most out of high school. This is not exhaustive um, because I'm actually, you know, all these copyright laws, you know, you're not supposed to be able to actually put the book on a slide, but I can change it and use it. So these are some of them. So what I want to just preface, and the reason I'm speaking so fast is that this is usually like a 90-minute presentation, and it was really hard for me to not want to include everything in this. So if you find things on this list and you say, oh my goodness, my child can't do this, that's okay. These are, these are things that we're going to talk about um, for high school, and then we're going to talk about employment, and we'll talk about residential settings, um, residential and friendships as well. So can your child prepare breakfast, lunch, snacks, clean their own room, do laundry, budget their time? And these are things that, in fact, if you think are important to work on, you could bring to your school to an IEP meeting to talk about including some of these as goals. Now, I just want to talk about laundry. My children, neither of my children, one who's a lawyer and one who has Down syndrome, did any laundry until they left home. Because I didn't want to take the time to teach them, and then I didn't want to have 16 loads of laundry when I could have only had five loads of laundry, you know, in separation. So that this doesn't mean that your child can't have an independent, productive, and meaningful life if they, they don't do all these things on this checklist. And you can also hire people to do them for you. I just wanted to include some pictures as I was learning more about um, the specific needs of the folks that you, you know, that you love. Um, I always usually want to put pictures up of, and we, Okay. Vocational skills. Can somebody get to work on time and punch in? And so this shows you how that this slide needs to be um, updated because when my son started working at 15, you punched in. And then you went to have to use your social security number. And you know now people are probably going to be online and doing other things. But whatever the, the, the strategy is, you need to learn it. Perform work satisfactory. Work cooperatively with coworkers. Take brunch and late lunch. Wear suitable clothing. This is tough for some of our guys, you know, because we've wanted them to become so, we want to promote their individuality, and so therefore, one of the things that most families have done is you've sort of backed off on the clothing. It's like, okay, you know, I'm, I don't really agree on the WWE t-shirts every day, but, you know, there are bigger battles to fight, but work is a little different. Um, safety procedures. So my son had a job on a on an island one summer and came home and said, you know, they didn't give me safety glasses when I mowed the lawn. And he knew that that was part of what needed to happen. So follow directions and accept supervision. You know, work is really different than school. And so for a lot of our folks, it's a challenge because in school, teachers are supportive and encouraging. And in the workforce, we hope that that's they're going to find um, employers that are like that as well, but employers have a different set of expectations. And so being able to understand different personalities are really important. Uh, so these some of your folks. I was trying to find working people in working environments. Um, hopefully somebody will find their child there. <laughs> that was my... So recreation and leisure. I actually think this is the toughest one in the area that we discount and we should really actually be paying a lot more attention to. Use free time for pleasure. Choose reasonable activities. Pick a hobby. Perform required activities and use community resources. Because as adults, most of our children will not find that they have the structure in their lives that they had when they were in school. And while some of your children may enjoy full and, full and complete employment, many of our folks are facing real obstacles um, at work, and especially um, at a time, uh, you know, in different economic periods of time when the unemployment is high, it's even more difficult. We're fortunately in a very low economic period, so it's a little bit more uh, easier to get jobs. But the leisure time is really important to find that skill, that interest, and then figure out how to do it. So something like even bowling requires somebody to find out where do you bowl, you know, what are the rules of the bowling alley in terms of getting shoes. Now at least most bowling alleys, you don't even have to worry about scoring because they do that for you. Uh, but you need to maybe find a friend to do that with, and then you might have to figure out transportation 
options to do that. What's gotten really, I think, um, better is, you know, technology has really made a lot of these things easier. But in spite of the fact that my son works two part-time jobs and he lives by himself, so it means he has to do his own shopping and cooking and cleaning and, well, not really cleaning, but um, uh, he has a lot of downtime. And, you know, occasionally I started FaceTiming him and, you know, the TV's on a lot. You know, that use of leisure time is, is really a challenge for, it's a challenge for a lot of people. So I think that using the school time to really actually have school teach people how to use community resources and all the skills that's required to do that. So. Go on. Still, I haven't hit one person here. Did you, I found, you found yours? Oh, yay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna try to get through these quickly because the content is, although this is probably the better content. Okay, Paul was going to edit these down, and I guess he had a hard time. Okay, sorry. Okay, community skills. Use public transportation. I don't know, do, is it t typical that most of your family members will get driver's license? Or is it... Um, so I'm seeing, I'm seeing a combination, of, uh, combination which is fairly typical of every audience that I uh, talk to have a child who have a learning or a developmental disability. The great thing now is I think there's so many more opportunities with Uber and Lyft to be able, and the use of technology. Our kids love you know, their iPhones and their iPads um, to be able to access and have many more um, opportunities. And with Uber and something like Lyft is a skill that I think we ought to be teaching our kids in school. And the, the, for me, I'm a big fan of it, although my son lives in an area where they don't have it um, uh, yet, is that you can then track, track where your child is. And there's a lot of safety features involved. But public transportation, on the other hand, you know, buses and cars and all those things are good. Shopping for groceries and make necessary appointments. Use the phone, use bank accounts, be safe in traffic among strangers, seek help if needed, handle money. These are some of the things that you really want your child to be able to have the opportunity to learn. And uh, you know, one of the things that my son learned when he was in a postgraduate program is what to do if you're lost. And we had a, a situation where I was, my daughter was a freshman in college, it was at parents weekend, and I get a call from him and he said, I'm lost and I'm scared. And I'm seven hours away, and he's at uh, the Boston Garden. For those of you who know Boston, that's where the Celtics play. He had just seen a Celtics game. And uh, he said, but I remembered what to do if I was lost because he had gone, he had actually studied it in, his, in class and practiced it in the community, and he had a card that he carried with him at all times that said, if you're lost, relax, look around, find help. So he said, I looked around, I went to the Dunkin' Donuts, and they brought him to the station master, and you know, a, you know, a few hours, you know, maybe a half an hour went by, and he got reunited, because he remembered he was in a van, and he was separated from the people that had come with him. He went with work, which was like, you know, made my heart sore that he actually was doing something with work friends. But in the meantime, I tried to call friends of mine, and they were going to come in, we were, live about 25 minutes away, to rescue him because obviously he was lost. And I realized that I was trying, by the time I got someone to go in, they had actually reunited him with somebody. And I realized that I was trying to protect him in such a way that he would have not realized that he could be successful in a situation that was stressful. And that was an important thing for him to, him to learn. And so the next day I called him and I said, what are you doing today? He said, I'm not doing anything. I'm very tired. You know I've never been lost before. <laughs> so we have to allow our kids to take some risks. Um, the next, OK. Going to get through. So I um, want to talk about shopping for grace, groceries because a lot of our folks think you know, that cooking is really complicated and you can't be independent if you can't cook. And so this is an old slide that I, that I got that really compared 
Um, actually, it was in the Boston Globe, I think, that they were, and this probably is several years old, but now the options for healthy eating, really, if your child can use a microwave and maybe a stove top, that's independence. And most of us are doing a lot of prepared foods, and we're doing Peapod and other home delivery systems. The opportunity to use technology and combine it and make our kids trying to do and so um, I was I'm also a big proponent of frozen dinners because they're portion controlled and in some populations people have a real hard time with weight gain as they get older and they're they become more sedentary and they're not running around as much um, so the, another skill is you know you, if you can't use a debit or a credit card you know some of our children are going to require some public assistance and that may include food stamps um, Remembering a PIN number, it's good that you have, you know, I love Apple, but they've made it so complicated because the Apple ID has to be, have so many different, you know, uppercase, lowercase, and then special symbols, and then as soon as you screw up, they make you change it. That's been the only difficulty because Jonathan and I share an Apple ID account is him being able to get in to do the work that he needs to do and buying what he has to buy. Um, but these are skills that if your child doesn't acquire them in high school, or it doesn't mean that they can't acquire them as adults. So I don't want people to get overwhelmed thinking we've got to do everything you know, at once. Um, but getting more. So social and personal skills. Supply appropriate personal identification. Everybody should have that. They turn 18. If they don't have a driver's license, they can still get a state ID. Greet pe people appropriately. This has been a real challenge for my son, who's you know actually a little, um, he's not shy, but he's a little reserved. And if you say hi to him, he'll say good, because he's already answering your second question, which is how are you? <laughs> and as much as we have tried, I've just, I've just kind of given up on it and uh, realized that some things I didn't do well. Use contemporary style of dress, hair, and makeup. Again, these, you know, the individual choices are challenging here because Purple hair seems to be becoming more and more um, mainstream, I guess. Um, talk with friends and coworkers, be courteous, be responsible, be happy. And I want to say happy is sort of, you know, really with two question marks, because we don't really expect everybody to be happy all the time. And people, we really need to understand that people have moods and feelings. Um, but in the workplace, and we're you know, generally out there in, or socializing, that, there may not, that may be the appropriate place to be happy, or at least be optimistic. And with Facebook, some, I've noticed that some of our folks, uh, and I need to add Facebook and social media to this, really need to be taught the tools of that. And sometimes there's too much sharing going on. And, and there's certainly local police um, departments that will do internet safety for you know, locally and talk to your children and other family members. And these are just not our kids who have learning disabilities, trust me. Um, I have a friend that just you know, posted, somebody I went to high school with and posted, it's been, you know, this would have been my 26th anniversary. We had a terrible divorce, and you know, every year I get the same you know, email, and I'm thinking, you know, this is way too much information. This is not what should be put on Facebook. So we all need lessons on it. Um, so um, I had to eliminate this slide because it was a picture of my son picking out a video at Blockbuster. You know, like there is no blockbuster. Technology has changed. What you really need to do is how can you, you know, he'll call up and say, well, how can I get this pay-per-view event on TV now? How do I use pay, you know, uh, on demand? Um, important things. Okay, I'm going to. Okay, so I don't know if this is happening to your children, but it certainly happened to the people that I support, and it happens, you know, happened to my son, that he came home from school when he was 16, and he said, when am I taking the SATs? And I said, why? And he said, because you need them to go to college. And when you spend your day included in a regular high school and everybody's talking about taking the SATs and going to college, that's what you're learning as well. So I said to him, well, you don't need the SAT to take for all colleges. And he said, well, which ones don't you need them for? And at that time, Bowdoin had just announced that they didn't, you didn't need SATs. But what he was saying to me was, I want to do something when I finish high school. I want to be like my peers. And uh, it was very important to do that. And so there are a lot of options you know, for our folks. And the options every day change, and it gets more exciting. And the only thing that makes me a little bit sad and jealous is that my son is 37 and not 17. Because the op what has happened in the last 20 years um, has even exceeded the dreams that I had. 
So there's a lot of opportunity for post-secondary education, and a lot of times that can happen, you know, uh, in the district. I'm going to try to get to the left. Um, but four-year colleges, um, if I meet a parent of a newborn, you know, who's been diagnosed with an intellectual or a developmental disability, I'll say to them, there's a great likelihood that your child will go to college. You know, there's, co there's programs at Clemson and, um, uh, I, actually, I'm now uh, um, Vanderbilt. I mean, I'm, I'm, these are some of the higher level colleges, but there are colleges, there are college programs on four year campuses all over the country for kids who need additional support. Um, but there are also children who have learning disabilities who are going, matriculating regularly at four year colleges and are using the supports of the disability student services. You know, so that we're not, ta you know, we're talking about kids who are going to graduate, they're going to get an, you know, a bachelor's degree, and they're going to college. Trinity College in Hartford, of which, you know, I matriculated at, had a front page article. They accepted a 15-year-old kid with autism. Okay, so maybe he was 16. So they had to deal with the fact that a young kid, and they publicly were saying, we took this kid with autism, and we have spent a lot of time educating our staff, preparing our community for this kind of student. And you know what, it's, that story is going to get repeated over and over and over, and it probably already is happening. Um, so I don't, you know, and as you were nodding and shaking at different questions that I've asked, your kids are all different. Some of your kids are going to go to four-year colleges. A, parents, you know, a parent just came, said to me, you know, my kid just finished his uh, first year at Boston College, and we thought he had a wonderful year. We didn't realize that there was some social isolation that was going on. And so you just want to be prepared and work with a, co a cooperative school. Community colleges are, uh, have always been uh, the you know, obvious choice for a gateway to college for students who might need some additional support, may want to live closer to home, may ha not have the financial resources. And community colleges continue to, to play that, a very active role for students with learning disabilities. And many of them have some programs that are specialized that are more cert certificate driven. My son went to Cape Cod Community College where he studied, got a certificate, he took a survey course the first year on you know, office skills, landscaping, retail of the areas and then he majored in landscaping and um, he has his dream job on a golf course so it always happens to be a great golfer so for him I didn't need the person-centered plan because he was able to tell us he wanted to work on a golf course. Um, College-based programs is what I sort of opened up with because this is the thing that excites me the most is that you know the federal government has really has recognized that folks with disabilities belong on college campuses and if a college has a program where 50 percent of the time is spent in regular activity they're eligible for Pell and Stafford loans. So things are totally different than what they were when you and I were in school in terms of the kinds of student that we're seeing on campuses. Um, we also have community-based programs, and, and my organization runs a lot of those where kids are going to graduate from, from high school, and they're going to stay in their community. They might work with an adult agency, and there's so many different, those can take so many different shapes. You know, they can go to a day program and be community-oriented. They can do a project search program. Have anybody heard of project search? Okay, Project Search is a um, employer-based program that started at um, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. There was a, an amazing um, emergency room manager who re looked around and said, 70% of our revenue comes from children who have disabilities, but isn't it remarkable that our hospital doesn't hire anybody with disabilities? So she started this program where in, in the last year of eligibility in high school, students would actually go to Cincinnati Children's Hospital and spend the year there immersed in an environment, in a work environment, and then with internships. Now that program has grown, so now it's all over the country and several, uh, several foreign countries as well. And there are spin-off programs like that. And so you have to decide whether or not you know, you, yeah, that's the direction you want to go in. But what's wonderful is that they don't, they're not mutually exclusive. You know, it's like, think about, you know, your kid could take a gap year. And then your kid can go to college. So whatever you think of for your typical child or typical children, same thing can hold true now for a child who needs a little bit more support. Now in the old days, the only thing that happened were kids stayed in um, high school for six to eight years. You know, they went to high school and most families have really rebelled, uh, rebelled against this to say, you know what, you can't go to this. I mean, unless you're really popular, you should only go to your se a senior prom once. 
you know, you are seeing your problem. Um, but that may face some families in some districts and will take some fighting because districts will say, well, we have our own transition program. Well, that's fine. Is the transition program happening at a local university or a local community college? Is it happening off the campus of the high school? Because if they're going to high school after they finished four years of high school, ask them to show you who else is doing that. And there are some private transition programs um, around the country as well. Those tend to be fairly expensive, but some school districts have been willing to support uh, families in going there. Um, and post-secondary programs in the school district I touched upon there is, um, and Massachusetts has, and I don't know if other states do, which is called concurrent dual enrollment, which allows students who are on an IEP to go to their community or state college free, and the school district has to provide the support to it. Sort of the rub, the school district really weren't involved in passing the law, but they're actually holding the bag and trying to make that happen. So those are things that may, um, may to look at as well. Post-secondary and transition programs and adult service agencies, where transition is such a hot topic that most adult service agencies hopefully are not going to say, oh, here is a program, and you're going to walk into a program and, and see 22 to 60-year-olds in the same environment, but you'll see a program that's been specially designed to try to supplement what your child received in school so that they can be much more employable if that wasn't um, an achievable goal while they were in high school. And uh, we have many, of, many examples of them, and it would be pretty easy to identify. If you want, want more information, I'll give you my contact information afterwards. Um, and so post-secondary programs in special education schools. Now in some states, Massachusetts being one of them, Connecticut, they have, we have a lot of special education schools. Other states like, um, although Connecticut actually just had a recent ruling that might change the way they talk about special education. Um, some states have very little reliance on special education schools, and many of those schools have um, transition programs within them as well. Um, just a, some good data. If you, if you've uh, anybody who's participated in po post-secondary education is actually going to have better employment outcomes. We know that they're going to have better employment outcomes and they're going to get ha uh, a higher salary. I also think that it's a just a much better quality of life. Um, so how do you go about doing all this? Um, if this seems overwhelming, this is pretty obvious. If you if you went to college, it's the same thing. You know, everything now is everything's there up and uh, everything's on the internet. Everybody's everything's between the internet and Facebook. You can find the appropriate programs. There are search engines that do this. There are you know w websites that have actually been designed to actually try to help you with this process as well. You know, when my son uh, applied to programs. The, and colleges, the exact, exact thing happened to him as happened to his sister four years later. He got accepted, he got rejected, he got waitlisted, which is you know what we would expect. At that time, however, I was trying to get him into college, and everybody thought I was crazy to think that the, he could, belonged on a college campus. And the only one that was willing to take him was um, Springfield College in Massachusetts. Um, but my fear was I didn't want him to be the only person that look different. I mean, well, actually, I shouldn't say that because there's so many kids who look different. But you know, he had spent his whole life being a, a role model and, a, and, a, and, a, and setting the standards for others. I really thought it was a good opportunity for him not to have to be in that role. Plus, when I, what they were offering was eating in a cafeteria, and he actually did that very well. Um, and it was more learning to cook for himself that was more important. And I actually had to look deep in myself because what was important to me was I wanted to be able to stand here and say that my son went to a four-year college rather than really identifying what his needs were. And when I was able to separate my ego from his needs, I realized that he needed something that was a little different than going to a four-year college, which would not have actually prepared him for the kind of um, meaningful life that I think he has. Okay, so this is, oh, this, this is the list I was trying to remember a few minutes ago, which, you know, now that I'm in my another decade, it's a little harder. But this is just some, of, uh, some examples of programs that not only approved by the federal government, are approved by the federal government, which allows them to participate in student aid programs. But this, I didn't update this list, and it's changing all the time. And a place, um, I'm going to give you a, a website, thinkcollege.net. Anything you want to know about approved programs, you can, you, can, you know, Put in the search engine the community you want to be in, you know, the state, 
everything and it will come up with um, come up with it and the, just a, a kind of interesting story that the first program that began for students with intellectual disabilities was at Bakersfield Community College in Taft California and it was it came out as an opportunity they had dismantled their football team and the football team had its own dorm so someone said let's start a program for folks with learning and intellectual disabilities and that program which is probably 25 years old has spawned this amazing network of colleges all around the country and every May if you're on Facebook and you are linked into linked with not linked in but linked with a lot of people with disabilities you will see all these amazing videos of kids with intellectual and learning disabilities opening up their acceptance letters you know and many of them are not going to be um, receiving degrees, but they're going to be spending time living and going to school among typical peers, which is what they've done for the last 22 years of their life, or 18 years of their life anyway. Uh, so I don't know if sc scoring is a big issue in your community, but it certainly is an issue um, in the, you know, the communities that I work in is that, that dreaded you know, IQ score that somebody is always saying you need to have an IQ score, it's part of you know, the IEP process. I happen to think they're kind of, you know, I'm not, I don't think they're particularly relevant because they don't tell us a lot about the um, untestable parts that really make our children uh, the joy and that they are. But unfortunately, everybody gets tested and it's sometimes a cornerstone for eligibility for services and then eligibility for financial assistance. So a little bit about testing, I think you have to be, you know, these are, you know, you don't have to just rely on a strict intelligence test, but there are other kinds of tests, this, there's, and these are a list of supports intensity scales that really look at the supports that somebody needs rather than the deficits that somebody has. Um, and the um, ICAP, these, these are proprietary tests um, that some states have adapted uh, determine the level of service or the priority for adult services. And if your state is going to do that, you want to make sure that who is interviewing the person, your family member, is somebody who knows your family member because that's the protocol of the test, but the state often doesn't, doesn't acknowledge that. So they'll bring in somebody who's never met your child or a case manager or service coordinator who maybe you've spoken to a few times but doesn't know your child. And the kinds of questions that are being asked has to be answered by somebody who knows your child. You know, so for example, does your, you know, if someone said to me, you know, does your child shower independently? Well, I might say yes, my son showers independently. How could he possibly not be showering independently? unless someone's coming in and doing it for him. But that's not going to help in his need for support services. The reality is he leaves shampoo in his hair sometimes. Now, do I care about that? No. But when someone's going to be asking the question, does he shower independently, I'm going to say no. Because I need him to get some supports. Maybe not for showering, but for other areas. So one of the things that's hard for families is that we've spent our whole life talking about our kids and what they can do and encouraging them and setting the bar as high as they can be. And a lot of these services are based on deficits. So you have to think about what your kids can't do. Because when you're asking for services, they're not going to get services when we, we describe them in the way we describe them when we're having a good day. So you have to remember the bad day. So I went to visit a family. And um, I was very surprised because the child had received a very low score and uh, in I could clearly see the child should have been in a different level, and I asked Dad about it, and he and he, Dad was just so proud of his daughter that he answered all these things somewhat in, as a dad. He didn't answer it from someone who thought that his child could use some support. So it's counterintuitive to everything that we we do as families, but it's important to remember. Um, so I think employment, if I'm you know, there's a big, big push for employment. And I think that for, that should be a goal for everybody. But I also think that an overarching goal is creating a meaningful day. And I happen to have chosen to work full time, but you know, there are days when I wish that I worked part time and I could be involved and that I would have more friends and maybe I would, I would golf. And there are a lot of people who have a great life and volunteer. And some people have, you know, 
economically an economic need to work and other people don't and, and some people don't care if they're you know able to go on vacation because they'd rather stay home with their children everybody has made a different decision and people with disabilities ought to be have make that decision as well but it is somewhat counterproductive to where we're going you know in an industry which is employment is the, is the highest and most valued attribute so um, there competitive employment you know, everybody could pretty understand that full employment, people are working. Supported employment, most people require some support before they can get, become fully competitive, and that would even be any typical person. You get to a new job, someone has to train you. The training for somebody with um, a, dis a learning disability might take longer and might need some ongoing supports, and that's what we call supported employment. It used to be that we had a large number of people in sheltered employment where people would go to a site, they might do piecework or assembly work. That's actually been eliminated in most states. The federal, the Justice Department has taken both um, Washington State, or Oregon, I can't remember, um, and Rhode Island to court and have basically said you cannot pay people sub-minimum wage anymore, so that's gone. It's a great thing, although there's been great pushback by some providers and we're in an interesting situation right now where the federal government I think is more progressive than actually providers who have become sort of institutionalized and perpetuating themselves rather than embracing new technology and new directions. So again this is a great opportunity for families to break open the doors of um, creativity and innovation. Temporary employment as well. Um, I talked about um, Project Search which are some innovative um, programs uh, I also wanted to, we were going to, there, there are also non-traditional kinds of things, you know, some people are um, public speakers and some people are, you know, professional advocates and some, what we're seeing more and more is opportunity for entrepreneurship and individualized business initiatives. So um, there's a young man with autism, pretty significantly involved with autism, and he runs a, um, a um, business because the part of doing kettle corn is cleaning the machine which apparently is not something that's um, you know an easy task and but has to be done regularly in order to keep up the quality of the, the popcorn um, and he loves that so and he was meticulous about that so that was something that you know he was able to get a small Vogue rehab grant for be able to develop a coffee company you know a kettle corn company and he goes to county fairs somebody who doesn't who's very limited verbal skills there's a young man that I, in when I'm writing my book, I really wanted to make sure that I covered the range of abilities because a lot of times you go to these meetings and conferences and they put up the superstars and the families whose children are not maybe going to have that achievement um, don't see where that, those opportunities might lie for them. So I met a young man in Alaska in the middle of nowhere but the cruise ships came for six weeks or eight weeks during the summer and he um, had a sea glass business. So he would tumble sea glass and package them into, um, into small pretty bags and sell them in the gift shops. And that was his business. But you can go online and find a million different kinds of things in terms of how people are, you really passion. And that's going back to person-centered planning that I started with, that identifying the passion. We want to go to work to do something that we love or that's important. But if we go to work and we're bored, whatever that is, we're going to either act out or, or um, you know, worse, not show up to work. Um, so for families, um, oh, I'm sorry, begin thinking about work early. Um, you know, helping out at home for those of you who have little ones, adolescents and high school, I think it's really important that, you know, our kids work, but I don't think they should be working at the expense of getting an education. So when my kid was in school, they said, oh, we don't want, you know, he's not going to go to class, he's going to join the trash, you know, the, the little recycling team here at the high school, and I said, I actually switched him from that high school. <laughs> I said, he doesn't pick up his trash at home. I don't expect, he's not going to pick up the trash of his peers. That's not how his peers are going to see him. And he should be working after school and weekends because that's when adolescents work. Now that was important to me. Another family might have found that it was important for their child to work during the school day because their child needed a different level of support. So whatever you're thinking, um, it doesn't have to be like the person next to you. Um, I'm, tr I, I'm trying not to read everything because I hate being at workshops where people just say, they read the slides and I'm thinking, well, why don't they just pass them out to me and leave the door, you know, go away. So hopefully um, you're able to read some of these. Um, but 
the other piece that's important during adolescence is having your child be active at their team meetings and being able to advocate for themselves if possible. My son actually didn't like, like participating in meetings. He found it really boring. You know, other um, young people enjoy not only being at the meeting but leading the meetings and that's what they should be aspiring to do by the time they finish high school. If that's comfortable for them, they should be leading their IEP meeting. See how that works with your school district. Um, and you know, incorporate the kinds of activities at home that encourage independence and assisting. And as again, every family is different and you do things differently. Um, but the transition has to be based on the, your child's preferences. Uh, my son loves being you know, outdoors and active. If he had to put on a tie every day, it would kill him. Now another family that um, in, they do um, unbelievable, the Turnballs from the University of Kansas who have done remarkable, remarkable and um, innovative work in families. Um, they, they had a son who was very, uh, had autism and was very involved, and yet dad was a college professor and every day went to his college work with a jacket and tie. So their son was able to express to them that he wanted to wear a jacket and tie to work. And so finding an environment where he could wear a jacket and tie drove them for him to have a job in a library at the university where he could wear a jacket and tie. Um, and you know the kinds of things to get your child ready for employment are the s kinds of things that you know you would do for any your any your child. One of the things that I really like to emphasize and is um, social capital. You know if you and and job development. So if you if I ask you to think back to how many jobs you've had since your first job, whether or not it was babysitting or delivering newspapers, you probably are in double. You're all in double digits. And you should expect the same thing for your child. You know, just because they get a job, that shouldn't be their last job. I mean, there are people who, you know, again, go to work for GM or GE and they stay there for 35 years, but that's becoming less and less typical in the American environment. And our kids need actually to have jobs and to fail at jobs or be able to identify the aspects of the jobs that they didn't like in order to be able to find sometimes their dream job. Um, and relying on your social capital to help them is the same thing that you probably have done for your typical children. You know, you know somebody to say, "We well, can my child have an interview or can you talk to my child what it means to work in your environment. Every job, my first job was a camp counselor. My father was on the board of the organization that um, ran the camp. Now maybe I would have gotten the job anyway, but it does help to have somebody make a call for you. And we should be able to be willing to do that or be willing to do it on behalf of a friend's child who might in return be able to do that. Eventually your kid is going to have their own social capital because they will be part of the community. I always actually I judge whether or not Jonathan is having, how good a life is, is how many people he knows that are not paid to be with him. And sadly, for a lot of our children, there aren't a lot of people who are just part of their lives who are not paid to be with him. I took him to a to get a, so this will sound like I'm a helicopter parent, but I'm really not. He lives lives two hours away from me. I, but he, he chooses to go to terrible barbers, so every once in a while I'll bring him somewhere to clean up. And so I went to a barber shop, and the, somebody said, hey, John, and I said, how do you know John? He said, well, John and I volunteered with Rotary when they built a miniature golf course for the YMCA. That's, that's, that's community membership. Now I can't tell you very many more stories like that. Now maybe there are, but those are the things that I really you know, hold up as really being a success in being having a full, and full life. So the benefits of work, you know, we talk about financial independence, but the, you know, the reality is that most of our folks you know, are going to require some, some sort of support. And really what it does is it's self-confidence, growth, and a, better, a much better social life. My son learned to drink, eat sushi because he worked. Um, and some, they took him, everybody went out to eat and they went to sushi and now he never would have eaten sushi for me but being with his friends he ate sushi. So non-traditional careers, public speaking, um, and this is a list of, you know, people are authors and artists and that's the, the glass guy that I was talking about and people do a lot of different things. And you know what, volunteer work, you know, this organization wouldn't be where it is if it weren't built on the backs of volunteers and their roles for volunteers for um, our children as well. Um, and the other is, you know, I mentioned gap year before, but the gap year, the national service organizations actually include people who have, who have learning and intellectual disabilities. You know, they are part, they're, they're on their radar screen, and these are just some of the national service um, organizations that have gap year. Um, I'm going to slip that because people probably know my job card. 
Okay, so um, leisure-based programs, I skipped through that slide, but that's where you know, people would go to a day program who needed a lot of support as adults um, that would not be based on, have employment goals, but would be in accessing the community and doing volunteer work, and that may be something for some folks um, as well. Um, I always say, you know, when you're looking for, when you're looking finally to f where your child is going to be, unless you live where I live and then you only have to look at one agency, that's mine, um, you should look at other places. I, I have two rules that I say to um, st parents. If there's a staff bathroom, that means that the bathroom that your child is going to be using is probably not as clean. And if, and if there's candy dishes out, ask whether or not everybody's able. First of all, there shouldn't be candy dishes because I'm. I think that fitness and health is more important. But you want to make sure that the people with the disabilities, if you're going to a disability, an organization which supports people with disabilities, values them in action, not just in word. And those are some of the. Uh, so housing options in terms of living into living. There's a lot of opportunities. One of the, I want to highlight. Um, adult foster care, which actually in some states is called adult family care, but for folks who are looking for a placement for their child to grow and become more independent, and it may not be able to happen in your family, my child could never be as independent as he is if he lived in my house. I just wouldn't have allowed him to take the risks. I would have been hovering, I mean, you know, there are times, and I don't know where he is all the time, but I would, you know, when I'm with him, you know, he, we can be in the supermarket, and all of a sudden he's not with me, and I get like panicked, and I'm thinking, are you nuts? He lives by himself, he's shopping all the time in supermarkets. But, you know, the mother instinct is really hard to break. But adult family care, foster care, is recognizing that some people really thrive in families, and that's where they should live, and it can't make, it, if you, it doesn't mean that we have failed as family members because we want them to live somewhere else. It means that we think the family unit is a good place for our child to thrive versus a community residence or independent living where they might be lonely. My son is a little bit lonely. No question about it. He's a little lonely. He would hate being in a group home because you know, having a whole bunch of people running around. I see him living in adult family care as he, as he ages and maybe needs more support. Um, intentional communities um, are, you know, sometimes they're happening where people are living multi generational. The, the thought of being of congregating people of with like disabilities together is not um, supported, funded, or will, is um, endorsed by the federal government. Thank God, because um, they are really going to just recreate segregation. And you've spent the last 22 years of your kids' life, or 30 years, or 40 years of your kids' life, including them in the community. Why would you want to, you know, bring them back? Um, unless it includes a lot of different people. But the majority of families who have kids with learning and intellectual disabilities, they live with their families. And, th and the idea that people would live somewhere other than their families is really a post-World War II phenomenon anyway. You know, and that is when, you know, and it actually coincided with um, sexual revolution and the introduction of um, the birth control pill, which gave women much more independence. And if you look historically, I read this and I thought, oh my goodness, it makes sense. I mean, my mother moved from her home into her marital home that doesn't happen anymore and so it does you know for our kids maybe that's being in the family home is an okay place to be for a long period of time we have to recognize that culturally we're all different some cultures really do have multi-generational people multi-generations living together so if everybody on the street as my mother would say well if everybody's jumping off the Empire State Building are you going to jump off too you know, if everybody is you know, pushing their kid to live independently, it doesn't mean that that's right for you and your family. Um, and the things to consider is what kind of home. And you know, if anybody, I think that everybody is, if they don't currently have mobility issues, they will have mobility issues. So I never develop anything but in a single level or ranch facility because I know that the years go by really quickly. Um, Pardon? Oh, that's you. Okay. With my twin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, they're beautiful. Good. Finally. Thank you. I got two for like 40. Um, you know, these are some of the things in terms of being an adult, registering. I know I'm probably getting the evil eye that I have to wrap up, but. Oh, this room for lunch? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, if you, um, anybody have any questions, well, we can, they, they'll open the doors and I can just talk over the lunch. <laughs> or the door opening anyway. Um, but, you know, the most important thing are families. You are the only constant 
and you, in the end of the day, it's going to come back to you over and over again. And siblings, the longest relationship ever. Okay, and this is some money issue. These are sources of income, but if you, um, you know, I go into great detail in, the, in my book, but these are, this is um, information that is fairly accessible in terms of how you could put together different sources of funding in order to be able to have your child be able to have a life if you're not in the position of funding it completely. So I know I have to go. Um, so thank you. So I knew it was too much information for a short period of time, but I'll be ha I'm going to stay around. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to um, answer them. And thank you. Thank you.